Warren, when did you first start drawing? When I was going to grade school, i uh, tell everybody after I got a little older that the reason I became a cartoonist because besides having a little bit of talent, I could get the girls to kind of look over at me. Although I had to realize I was very bashful, but I still wanted to look at the girls. And I would draw while I was in grade school. Everybody would look at me and look at my drawings. I thought I was good. I thought out later on I was horrible. But in those days, you could draw two matchsticks and it was good. A piece of paper, I would put a drawing, and the teacher would compliment me, and the kids thought I was a pretty good artist. And then one of my friends told me about the drawing, India Drawing Inc., and I never even heard of it. And my dad was going to a town which was about seven miles away, and we had told him to get me a bottle of drawing ink. It cost all of 25 cents. And uh, couldn't wait till he got back. It was about 11 o'clock at night. My bro older brother and myself got fooling around with this ink, looking at it, and it was a tremendous thing to compare it with the comics in the comic newspaper. And the funny thing about it, we didn't know that a ruler uh, had a edge on it where it wouldn't blot, and we'd go with a pen and, and move the ruler, and there was ink all over the place. And then later on, uh, a local newspaper, the Pittsburgh Press, had a contest for amateurs. And I started submitting cartoons there, and I was winning almost every week. I would prepare a book, but they also gave you a box of candy if your work appeared. And I'd get the candy so that I could help out, and my brothers and sisters and my mom and dad could have a piece of candy. And I was winning almost every week. And one of the funniest things was I had a quartet of singers in Pittsburgh, and I drew the quartet, the famous quartet, and they published it. But I had five people in it, and they said that Martin really believes that a quartet should carry a spare. That was one of the first funny things I ever saw or drew that I realized that I must be a comedian and not know it. And uh, when I was a little older than that, I sent a cartoon to Tidbits, which was a magazine of humor, something like Judge. They had a Judge magazine in those days. And uh, I got a $5 for it, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world, uh, that here I was, and I'd walk down this little community thinking that people should look at me. And I've spoken of this before, that here, look at this Martin, he's a great artist. He, he had a cartoon published. And, uh, what year was that? What year was that? That was in the 20s, about 25, something like that. And then later on, uh, amateur contest came out, and I was winning two or three dollars. My dad died when I was 17. I was working on a railroad. My dad died, and my mother was from Slovakia. Really, really uh, frugal, because she had to be. I mean, we raised her with seven children, and a lot of her during the Depression. So I didn't care how long. I was never concerned about how long I, the comic magazine was going to be in business. And so I got paid for what I was doing. And in those days, Five dollars was a lot of money. I remember uh, I had gone to, to a local bank and I had a fifty-dollar check from cartooning. And one young neighbor of mine went in, in the, we, we referred to as town. And when he saw that I had, came out of the bank with fifty dollars, he said, "You know," he says, "I've never seen that much money before." And he was twenty years of age. Actually, I was visualizing myself as someday in the future drawn comics for the newspaper. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Did you have a studio set up at home? In your <laughs> studio? Well, did you have a drawing table? Did you have I, a had a, I had a drawing table, and believe it or not, I still have the drawing table in the basement. The drawing table, yeah? I think we paid two or three dollars for the thing. And I had a little spot near, near a window. I couldn't even draw at night. I had to do it during the day because uh, the only light we had was up in the center of the ceiling. And my mother, who before I started selling, she said, what are you wasting your time at the drawing board? Why don't you go down there to just follow Joe Patrick? I heard he got a job down there working in the Coke ovens for, he's making $4 a day and you were standing here fooling around with these drawings. She never thought I was going to be, do anything with it. Then later on, I took a cousin and I took a trip across the country, Hoboken from Pittsburgh uh, to California and back. And we had quite a number of adventures, and I had a little sign kit. I had oboe signs on it, and uh, several times a policeman would, railroad bulls as we called them, would stop us, and they 
looked at my sign and wanted to know what I did, and I said I painted signs, and that let me go. Otherwise, we'd wind up in a jail, although I did stay in many a jail and slept in them. And how long were you and your brother on the road? I was with a cousin, and we were at least five months, and I have many a thrilling or really delightful experiences about our trip. Well, you used it as a reference to be able to do other things. What, what did you do with it? I happened to run across a magazine uh, that had comics in it, and since I had a little talent, my oldest brother George said, oh, let's see if you can, maybe we can sell him something. Although I had fooled around in, in the amateur contest and won some things. And uh, so I drew up a couple of features and sent them to a fellow by the name of Bill Cook. And to so my surprise, he said we had something there. He would like for us to go ahead and draw it. I was pretty lucky. I had a sister in New York at the time, and I visited her. Then I had gone down to see Bill Cook. I had no idea what offices were like, but raising the country. I went up there and got on, I looked on the directory, saw where, what floor he was on. I went up and started looking around, find out where in the world was his office, and I finally found a number. And I didn't have sense enough to open up the door and walk in. I thought that was it. So I started knocking on the door. And I heard finally after knocking there for about five minutes, I heard someone say, come in. And I walked in the office. Man, I was a country boy with ten legs. I tell you, I, I was dumb, not city-wise. And thank goodness I, I didn't stay down very damn long. <laughs> And at that time, there was a brilliant hockey player by the name of Bill Cook. And I said, are you the same one? He says, no. He said, I wish I was. I'd be making more money than I am now. So Bill was a big help to me. Uh, he suggested I do different things, make different changes on my ideas. And he gave me some suggestions. And it was a big help. He had me draw covers for him, and I was getting all of $5 a page. But that only lasted under a year, and then uh, Centaur took over, and I went over to them. Who was Bill Cook like? What was he like? Yeah. He was a nice fellow. He uh, a little on the heavy side, pleasant man. I think he was a great man, but uh, that's about all I knew about him. You didn't know what he did before he was in the comic book business? Uh, I don't know. Well, really, I don't know. He must have been a writer. Didn't stay in very long, did he? Not very long. Not very long. Did you meet his partner at all? No, I don't think I ever met his partner. Uh, no, I don't. Because they had both left DC Comics at one point. They, I think one was the financial officer and one was the editor. Mm -hmm. um, and they had both left to start uh, the company. Your hobo stories, you used them in a strip that you did for, uh, was it for Cook or was it for Centaur? It was for Cook. He's the one that uh, when he first saw that. That was the first strip that I made, and then I was in the CC camp for a year, and I did work there. I, I was one of the original, draw something on your sweatshirt or T-shirt, and I'd get a few pennies for doing that, because we only got $5 a month's work, and they sent 25 to our folks at home. So uh, I was out picking up a nickel or a dime or a quarter or whatever. I also ran the camp store while I was in there, and I was doing a lot of drawing. I drew for the... CC newspaper, which was published in D.C. It was quite interesting. The hobo strip, what was it called? Hobo Aussie. Being British, which I am not, I dropped the H. Did you use a lot of your adventures in that strip, in terms of the stuff you and your country? Well, I, I knew about hobo because I was on the road. I slept in the jungle. I, the jungle, that's where the hobos stayed. I slept in jails and missions. And one of the funny stories about the mission, we were in Denver, uh, and after they made us take a shower, gave us some gruel or swill for dinner, and then they had a little entertainment. And I always tell this because I think it's funny, and this is true in life, where somebody does all the work and somebody else gets the credit. Uh, this fellow got up on the stage and was playing the mandolin, and he was terrifically good. I mean, he could just tell what he was, what he was playing without singing. And when he finished, he put the the instrument uh, leaned it up against the chair and walked off, and nobody gave paid any. I looked around, nobody gave him a hand or anything. And after he got out of sight, another man came out and picked up the instrument and started walking off, and they started hooting and whistling and hollering as if he did all of the darn work, and all he did was carry the instrument off. It was a put-on job, and it was funny. 
And I used that in cartoons many times after that. So you did get to use some of your experience? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll use a lot of my, some of my adventure stories that I drew, but uh, because of my experience on the road and being a hobo. When did you start doing the CCK? After we came home from bumming around the country, I noticed and I heard that the government had formed a civilian conservation corps. And uh, they were, anybody who was eligible who was on welfare or relief, as we used to call it, and you would go into it, and you'd work one year. They would give you clothes and food and shelter, and they'd give you $5, and they'd send $25 home to your folks or whoever, if you were married, but they weren't taking any married men in. And I went in, and there was no time at all after they found out that I could draw. I wasn't the smartest guy there, but I guess I was just the luckiest. I got to be the first aid man for the doctor, and I ran the camp store. And So were you the CC kid? Well, not necessarily. It was just my imagination. When you deliver a job to Bill Cooks, for example, what would it be like going in the office? It was just like one room, one room, he was, he was, to my recollection, he was behind a desk, and I'd show him a drawing, and we'd sit there and talk, and he would tell me that uh, I ought to change this or that. But as I recall, I took him finished work down. But then I'm beginning to realize that what we refer to as the fisherman's luck story, I had a different title, so it must have, I must have just, that, that was incidentally was the first feature that I sold him. So uh, Centaur came in. Who were the people that you dealt with at that point? Well, while I had gone to Centaur, they had uh, two gentlemen, one by the name of Joe Hardy and, uh, and the other Harley. And they started this company, and they called it Centaur. And I would go into the... They had one special place where the, the art department was. That's where I... With Gilkinson, that's where he was able to stand there and talk, and he would show me, and he was really a good artist. I used to hang around there a lot because I was in great demand. I would do covers for him and spots, and as you can see by my magazines that I had features that I've done, I did a lot of work for him. Did they take over the same offices that Cook had had before? No, they moved to a different place. They had a much larger place. A fellow by the name of Jack Kay was, was their editor, Lloyd Jack Kay. And he looked over the cartoons, and he was a big help, too. I think I was the only one that, uh, maybe not, but I was the only one that did my own writing, too. I did uh, articles or the stories, the lettering, the inking, everything. I did it all, the whole, as they now say, ball of wax. It was interesting. Did you meet many other artists when you were working for these? While guys? I was there, I met Jack Cole, I met Bill Everett, and uh, George Brenner and a few others. And they had one elderly man who was a brilliant cartoonist who had worked for the NEA, and uh, he was an alcoholic, and uh, they fired him, and he was doing fill-ups or fill-ins and inking and paste-up for Centaur. And he, he was a big help to me, too. He taught me how to use a artist brush, which was a watercolor brush. And I started using that, plus a pen, how to use a pen also. Did they have people on staff there, or did they ever, was everyone working for you? They had staff, well, they had staff, and then there was a, well, well, I'll always remember this, and I get embarrassed when I think of it, that a young boy and a young girl, I, when I say young, they were probably about 20, 21, brother and sister. And uh, I, being rather naive and from the country, I didn't know too much about anything, really. And there was a movie, a big hit, came out and called, uh, I pronounce it, Less Miserable. And I told him, I said, I had heard that was a good picture. And he kind of looked at me, odd like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> and I realized I should say, Les Miserables, and I called it Less Miserable. <laughs> and another funny thing happened. I thought that everybody spoke the same thing all over the country. And in one of my strips, I used the word nebby. And uh, they called me into the office and said, well, what does nebby mean? Well, I said, well, everybody knows what nebby means. And I said, no, we don't know what it means. I said, well, where, where I live, nebby is a person that wants to know everything. If you're talking, wants to come in there and, and mention uh, what they think or they want to know what you're doing, it, in other words, they're nosy. They had never heard of it. Well, I looked it up in the dictionary and talked to other people. They said, no. Except in Pennsylvania where I lived, they knew what Nebby was. And I used a lot of stupid stuff in the, in the comic magazines that they had to correct. 
Did you work in the office at all, or did you work at home all the time? I always worked at home. So oh. did you go in like once a week to turn your jobs in and see what was going on? I would go down sometimes two and three times a week because I was learning as well as selling. I was getting all of five dollars a page. Who were the guys that worked on staff there that you'd see? Mr. Hardy and Harley and uh, Lloyd Jack Kay, because he he was their head man as far as artwork was concerned. And uh, and so you'd run into people like Jack Cole. And did you socialize with any of those guys? You don't want me to tell you the story about Jack Cole, do you? Sure, absolutely. Well, I got to know Jack pretty well, and he was a good artist. And uh, one day I'd gone down there, and I was wait in a waiting room, and they told me that. Uh, Jack was in there having a conference with uh, Mr. Hardy and, and his partner, and Jack came out, he was pale looking, and he had walked out, and didn't, didn't even say a word to me, and when I went in, they said, uh, we want to tell you something, and I said, what is that? They said, well, we want to warn you, because we don't want you to do what Jack did, and I said, well, what did he do? They said uh, well, he was. He told us that he was in a big hurry for a story. He wanted to meet a deadline, although they had no deadlines. And he happened to see a story in uh, Collier's magazine, a science fiction story about somebody being sh shrunk and going way off into another world. And uh, a person in it was Thompson or Johnson or something. And Jack took the story drew it up as if it was his own. All he did was change the name, the plot, the char characters, everything was the same. And uh, someone caught it, told it about us, and we were afraid that Colliers would read it and they would sue us. And that was Jack. Uh, he had picked up this story because he was in a, in a pinch for it. To me, I always remember that, but Jack became a very, very famous cartoonist. Did and, you ever talk to him about his work at all? Or his... Oh, we used to discuss it, but never after that. Never, after, I never ran into him after that. But they continued buying stuff from him, but they sure warned him. It was Miracle Man. Well, it was an offshoot of what uh, the trend in those days. You either were a uh, submariner or you were whatever. And I just said, wait, everybody knows about the Billy Smitty. The Mighty Man and all that, and I came up with the idea of Mighty Man, and I said, well, why don't I just go ahead and elaborate and do things that Superman couldn't do? And that would shrink, change his features. Then I would involve him in things that I knew about, like country, timber, and later on, Jack Cole, when I was in the service and was no longer drawn to Mighty Man, Jack Cole made the plastic man out of Now, he may have not taken my idea, but he sure as the devil, after that incident about him taking that thing from Collier's, I just questioned it. What was Lloyd Jacquet like? He was a nice guy, a very guy, a very nice, very helpful to me. I visited him in his office a couple of years after I had quit. I had gone into New York and... I found out where he was at, and I walked into his office and talked with him and met Mickey Spillane there, and later on, Mickey Spillane, he, he was a writer, he was not an artist, and he, he write for him. My brother, who was in the service, my brother Victor, said he saw a comic magazine where a mall in there was named Mrs. Felchalk, so we're, I'm assuming that Mickey wrote the story. Jacquette, what happened to him after a centaur closed? Did he start his own show? Well, he still had his own stable, because he put out whether he worked magazines or whether he sold the ideas or whatever, I don't really know. But I, he, he may have gone into publishing on his own. Did you work for him at all after that? I did not work for him after all. So and I did not want to work for him because when I had gone in there, I was still working. I, the reason I had gone into New York because I was now working on a railroad uh, in a roundhouse as a machinist helper or boilermaker helper or whatever. And I could get railroad passes, and it wouldn't cost me a nickel to go to New York. And I had gone in there to say, and I was in the meantime, I was selling gag cartoons and getting more for a little small drawing than I was for a whole page. And besides working on the railroad, I had a salary. And uh, I didn't want to go back into comic magazines. And even when I got out of the service in, in 46, I did not want to go into the comic magazine, uh, drawn comics. And I met a young chap in there who could speak Spanish fluently, and he worked for a newspaper in, uh, in New Jersey. I forgot the name of the newspaper. And he also was selling uh, stories to the comic magazine. We became quite close friends. 
When did you go back to Pennsylvania from New York? Well, I would go off and on, uh, even when I was working for Centaur. But having a sister that was like having a home in New York and home in Pennsylvania. So I'd go back and forth. It wasn't expensive. It was in those days because money was it was worth more than it is now. I mean, in those days, if you got 10 or $15 for a cartoon, that was a lot of money. And now if you get 300 for a little spot cartoon, you feel that you're going to be cheated. Even National Enquirer pays $300 for a little drawing. They got some letters from uh, readers, and some of them weren't written by me, because that was a policy in those days uh, where you wanted the editor to think that you got that you got you did a great job. You'd have some relative from who knows where writing a letter, say, "Hey, this this guy got a good good cartoon here. Who is he?" And all that stuff. In the meantime, you probably wrote the darn thing. I picked a couple for Centaur. My brother was in Washington D.C. And he had some fans down there, and I sent him a letter, and I had told him to have this guy put in there and say how great my my comic strip was, or my feature. And an address, the address was a legitimate, but the writing wasn't. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't the only one that did that. Were you going to get a raise out of that? No, but you wanted your feature to keep running. Since the other guys were doing it, you wanted to get some family mail in there too, wouldn't you? Because they might kick you out. They'll say, how come Bill Everett is getting all kinds of letters there saying how great his stuff is? And Martin Filsack, he's not getting any. Well, I made damn sure that Martin Filsack got some. I had gone back to Pennsylvania but just about the time they were giving up. I didn't realize they were folding or going to sell. We were having trouble with Hitler in World War II. And I was drafted, but because of my eyes, I wore glasses. I was put on 4F, and I was put off for about a year. And I had been working on a railroad when I was 17 until I was about 19. And they called me back. They needed men working in a railroad in a roundhouse. And they called me back, so I went going back to Pennsylvania. And while I was there is when I found out that uh, Centaur was no longer buying cartoons. And I think that they had several of my features that uh, I never got paid for because several of them showed up later on in other magazines. Did you talk to Bill Everett when he was there? He was I there. talked to him several times, yeah. And he had that submariner, and uh, he, he did a good job. And then he went to, I think it was Chesler. I could have gone there, too. I was 40, I think, 42 months in the service. Wound up as staff sergeant, was with the Eighth Army headquarters, New Guinea and Philippines and Japan, making cartoons for the soldiers who were tired of riding home and I'd get 50 cents for a drawing, but when I was real smart, I had a mimograph machine, access to a mimograph machine. I would finish it, about 90% finished, and put the other 10% on, put the guy's name, and, uh, and maybe a little greeting from him, and get a colored pencil to color a little. Take me about 15 minutes, and I'd get 50 cents, but then when we got into Japan, I got real smart. Uh, I wouldn't take money. I wanted some of their candy or cigarette ration. Then I'd go out and black market it to the Japanese, or I would get about $10 for originally. I would have only gotten 50 cents. The only thing that I had worked for was the, the camp paper, and that was uh, Bimograph stuff, and I did drawings for them. And uh, another thing that probably changed my whole life, Disney had sent out a man to come out and interview people who would like to come out and work for him in uh, California. And I had missed him by a couple of days. I found out too late that he had advertised for people with talent. And I, I'm sure I could have gotten it, but I wrote them a letter and requesting some information, and they sent me an application for me to fill out and send them some of my work. And I thought I was too old for that. I thought, hey, you're too old. You're up in your early 20s. I think I was about 24 or something, and I was too old to go out there, and I never did go. Now, I never filled it out. And I'm sure I could have gone to California and worked in their animation department. Because later on, after World War II, I uh, met uh, several people who had worked Disney, and they decided to come to New York and work as freelancers. And also, when I was in the Army in the service, we had a young woman who was uh, working in our office that uh, worked for Disney in her animation. She did the background coloring, and she told me all about it. And she said, that was tough work, you know, to be under a light all the time, and, and very, very hard work. Uh, Walt Kelly was one of the guys who ended up uh, in going. Yes, yes, uh, several others. When you went in 
to pick up your work or drop off your work? Did you go out to lunch with these guys and see what was going never, on with them? Never, never, no. I was somewhat, uh, believe it or not, backward. You wouldn't guess by now the way I talk, but uh, I was somewhat backward, and I didn't associate with practically no one at all. Did you end up talking shop with any of these guys about, you know, obviously you learned how, how to use a pen and a brush from one of the guys there. Did you talk to other guys about this, the features they were doing or the strips they were doing at all? No, most of us fellows in those days were rather cladish. We were somewhat skeptical and somewhat afraid that maybe you steal our ideas or whatever. But then after World War II, when I uh, got into freelancing and would meet the people down in their very offices, like Collier's or American or Saturday Evening Post or True or some of the other publications. After World War II, everybody used cartoons, everybody. And there was probably 50, 60 fellows would go around from one office to another on every Wednesday. It was on a Wednesday. And uh, you'd get to talk to them. And I've seen where two fellows would have the same idea, and one would look at another one and and he says, yours is better than mine, and you tear it up and throw it in the wastebasket. Things have changed up since. There's very few markets left. When you were doing the comic books for Centaur, did you follow any of your competitors, or people who were doing work in the same books as you, just to look at style, look at uh, content, and that kind of thing? Oh, yes. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, I wish I had some of the magazines, because I would get several copies of each one while I was in New York, of each magazine that I had my work appearing in, or if I didn't put just a few out, so consequently I had cartoons in every one that they published. They published three or four or five, I forget how many, and I would do covers for them. And I was glad to do the covers because, and again, I'm repeating, $5 for a one drawing instead of a whole page. And I always did like to do covers. I didn't do the coloring, just the black and white. But we would keep track of one another, and I would envy some of the fellows that were very, very, very good. And some of them became big-time cartoonists. Ken Ernst and uh, John Prentice, uh, I met him. He worked for Red Kirby. Who, this was after World War II, and he put out a, a love story comic magazine, two or three issues. And at that time, it was a big hit, but he came in on the tail end of it, and he practically lost his shirt. And he even had a heart attack over it. He lost so much money on it because practically everything came back to him. My cartoons started appearing in many other different publications. During World War II, they were using my cartoons. Some, I think, were original that I never got paid for, and the others were reprints. And they were reprinting in, in like, Stars and Stripes, and all. Oh, there was several different ones. And I ran across couple of them after World War II, like Charlton had a magazine, I don't recall the name of it, and that was one of my features in there. Contacted them, tried to get reimbursed, and they told me nothing doing, they don't know how going to pay, but they were a cheap outfit anyhow. But I was selling them gag cartoons, so I didn't quarrel with them, and they were buying a lot of girly stuff. And then uh, my brother, who was in Europe, he would run across my uh, comics in many a magazine that I never heard of that they had reprinted. There was a lot of that going on in, in those days. Buy somebody out that had folded, start printing. They're still doing it, I think. I think that if I would just stick to comic magazines that I could probably develop style that is very popular nowadays, big muscular guys and beautiful busted women and things of that sort. But Your style, which is basically humorous style for the most part. Yes. I can do covers, advertising, I can change my style, I do spot work, I do religious stuff, I do sexy stuff. I can even do strips drawn for the school system in Sarasota, Florida. And actually, they wanted to put me on salary. They had no idea. I never finished high school. And uh, they marveled at my work. I did a lot of excellent, excellent work. And the reason I am a cartoonist is because I had a little bit of talent. Even if I had to work 20 hours at it, if I enjoyed it, rather than have somebody tell me, you got to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning or at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you had to be there to work, and someone's going to tell you what to do. I would rather work on something that I like, and since I had the talent. And one of the things, when, believe this or not, when I was first working on a railroad, I would take a piece of coal, and uh, the seats were sort of le leather where the engineer sat, and I would be drawn on that thing because you could erase it. It was almost like a blackboard. And I would be drawn on it, and I said, I'm, one of these days I'm going to be a cartoonist.